The eye of the storm is so named because it is an area of calm weather sitting, like a pupil, in the central point of a cycle. One might use this analogy to describe our relationship with the crucial moment in history which we are currently experiencing. These are exciting times. We so quickly forget the magnitude of what is truly going on. It all appears so calm here, in the eye of the storm. But the past 20 years have seen the beginnings of a radical paradigm shift taking place on every level of society, before our very eyes. From production, to social interaction, to our very consciousness itself, at the center of it all is the machine. This is a series on man's symbiosis with technology, past, present, and future. You may have heard of a principle in computing known as Moore's Law. In 1965, Gordon E. Moore, founder of Intel, observed the ability to double the number of components on an integrated circuit on a yearly basis due to the downscaling of semiconductors. This projection allowed for a predictable increase in processing speed and thus computing power. It is for this reason that an iPhone 6 has about 1300 times the processing power of the computer system on the first spacecraft to land on the moon, while being 286 times lighter and drastically smaller. And that was only 46 years ago. You see, for nearly the entirety of human history, not much changed in terms of technology from one generation to the next. The world in which you lived would be basically the same as the world your father lived in, and the life of your grandchildren would be much like your life. But all of that began to change with the advent of the Industrial Revolution in the early 1800s. Advancements in textile production led to a shift from a mostly agrarian lifestyle to an industrial civilization in which more and more people lived in urban environments. Within one lifetime, the world shifted from tilling farms by hand to driving in cars, from slow-paced farm life to the unionization of an emerging labor force. And our rate of progress has only increased. Up next, the beginnings of the computer. During the height of the Second World War, the U.S. Army enlisted the University of Pennsylvania's Electrical Engineering Department to create what is believed to be the world's first computer. Occupying 1,800 square feet, the ENIAC cost about $500,000 to make, roughly $6 million in today's currency. When the completed machine was announced to the public in 1946, it excited industrialists and engineers alike, leading to the invention of integrated circuitry the following decade. However, the high cost and technical ability needed to operate kept computers out of the hands of the consumer for quite some time. But Moore's law held true, and as microchips became smaller and more powerful, they also became less expensive to produce. This became increasingly apparent with the invention of the Apple II computer in 1977. For the first time ever, computers were within reach for the average person. Shortly after, with Apple's Mac operating system and later Microsoft's Windows, computers became increasingly accessible and required less and less technical ability to operate. Then, in 1989, British scientist Tim Berners-Lee developed the World Wide Web using the TCPIP protocol developed by the U.S. military's ARPANET and later expanded upon in the academic world as the Internet. Lee's World Wide Web allowed people to browse the Internet by domain name for the first time.
but traveling over a narrow bandwidth via telephone lines and being accessed on relatively primitive 1990s computer hardware, the internet was slow at first, taking nearly a decade to become even a shadow of what it is today. But near the end of the decade, a data compression technology known as MP3 format allowed for digital audio files to be compressed to about one-tenth their original size. Now, songs could be downloaded through the internet via new file sharing programs like Napster for free. Leaders of the recording industry were not pleased, battling against the service, leading to lawsuits and the eventual shutdown of Napster. In stepped Apple. Utilizing a proprietary format akin to MP3, Apple introduced iTunes, and shortly thereafter, the iPod, after the return of their ousted founder, Steve Jobs. Using software similar in nature to their predecessor, Napster, and portable audio device technology like early MP3 players, Apple created a hip new way to listen to music on the go, while rebuilding their floundering reputation. Up next, the world comes online. Early in the new millennium, faster internet speeds via DSL and cable became available. No longer would slow download speeds prevent people from doing things like, say, streaming a song or even a video online. With new technologies like flash animation, this became easy to achieve. Soon, Wi-Fi was developed, and about the same time came an increased interest in social networking. Even Napster's founder, Sean Parker, found solace in a fledgling company, Facebook, for which he served as the first president. This shift in the focus of the web towards socialization and user-generated content later came to be known as Web 2.0. At the same time, widespread adoption of websites such as megalithic search engine Google made the internet even easier to navigate. With advancements in processing power and web design, the possibilities were expanding, with exciting new sites like Wikipedia, Reddit, and MySpace all becoming household names. The internet was growing up, and with it, a generation of children too young to remember a world before the machine. These people readily adopted new technologies when they became available, like Twitter and YouTube, leading within a few short years to incredible moments in the history of civilization, from the Occupy movement to Anonymous to the Arab Spring, and virtually all of it organized digitally with an inexpensive, portable new device, the smartphone. In 2007, Apple released an innovative product crossing technology from their failed Newton device, the iPod, and PDAs and cell phones of the day. The iPhone became possible, in effect, because of the principles explained in Moore's Law leading to smaller, cheaper components, as well as advancements in wireless data technology, such as 3G, which allowed data to be transmitted at a rate comparable to household internet service even in remote regions. Shortly thereafter, Google, who had expanded outside of the search engine market, released the Android phone, a smartphone like the iPhone, crossing PDA and cell phone into one. Steve Jobs, at the time, had served as sort of a mentor to Google's founders. But after the release of the Android, he held a grudge with them until his death. Since Steve Jobs' death, we've seen even further advancements and downscaling of technology. From the Apple Watch to exciting new gadgets in the world of virtual reality, like the Magic Leap, Samsung Gear VR, and Oculus Rift. And yet, there are still people alive who are much older than the first computer. 
Based on this understanding of how far technology has come in less than a single human lifespan, we can use Moore's Law to extrapolate our current technological trajectory 10, 15, or 20 years into the future. Keep in mind that this growth is exponential, so computing power can become magnitudes higher within a short time span, as we have illustrated. You may be picturing computers that are smaller, sleeker, lighter, and faster. While this is certainly down the pipeline, there are things far more difficult to conceive of that are right around the corner. Case in point, artificial intelligence. Robots have stepped out of the realm of science fiction and into reality. The earliest incarnations relevant to our discussion have been primarily used in the labor field. Examples of this include Amazon's skew reading order picker robots, Tesla's robot snake charger, trailer loading robots at Budweiser plants across the country, and even robot chefs and servers in Japan. This is in addition to various advancements in military and law enforcement technology, which are becoming increasingly normalized within the public eye. But one thing that all of these examples have in common is their objective lack of sophistication when compared with where we know that robotic technology is capable of going. Many of these devices rely on remote control by humans while others use barcode readers, hydraulic systems, and basic codes allowing them to perform uniform, repetitive tasks ad nauseum. Obviously, these were necessary achievements, sort of stepping stones, required for continuation of technological progression. But in a very short while, we will look back on these basic robots as a relic of simpler times as people do of those enormous early computers today. The reality is that sentient robots are coming. In fact, they are here. The idea of sentient machines has fascinated philosophers and futurists alike for many years. In 2004, Martin Rothblatt, creator of Sirius Satellite Radio, launched the Terraset Movement, a transhumanist school of thought focused on cyber consciousness and techno immortality. Unlike many futurists who aim to digitally replicate biological processes in order to mimic human life, Rothblatt believed that human consciousness could be essentially cloned in the form of what she deemed a mind file using future consciousness software called Mindware. This mind file would utilize biographical videos and photos for things like voice recognition, face recognition, and sense of past. It would also rely on data, providing information on taste and preference, even responding with the same mannerisms, attitudes, values, and beliefs of the person whose mind they intend on cloning. An even richer portrait of you will be painted based on geomapping, tagging, and a timeline of your life events, from the day-to-day -to, -day to the memorable. On paper, this mind file would essentially be you. This concept intrigued roboticist David Hansen so much that he contacted Martin Rothblatt in 2007 about creating a proof of concept incorporating the Terrasim movement's idea of a mind file into a lifelike humanoid robot. Martin agreed, commissioning Hansen Robotics to create an artificial intelligence based on her wife, Bina. This resulted in the creation of Bina 48 in 2010. Bina 48 is named after her 48 exabytes of memory and 48 exaflops per second processing speed, numbers that seem entirely inconceivable to me. Bina48 is able to have a full conversation 
complete with facial expressions, head and eye movement, and motion tracking to see where people are in the room. She seems so close to human, but something doesn't feel right. Her motions lack fluidity. Her voice has that computerized quality, reminiscent of Siri or Cortana. Her skin lacks a certain je ne sais quoi, and she interrupts a lot, at times even interrupting herself. Did I mention she's just a bust? But in the grand scheme of things, none of it matters. These are minute problems that will be ironed out. The technology will become better, smaller, and less expensive to produce. Already in Japan, there are robots whose skin and hair are virtually indistinguishable from organic. Just a half hour from my home in Massachusetts, Boston Dynamic has built a robot able to walk, pick up objects, and pick itself up when it has fallen down. These similar technological breakthroughs will ultimately be merged into what is, for all intents and purposes, a human being. But what does that mean for humanity? As we've discussed, more and more jobs are being eliminated due to automation. It happened slowly at first, with ATMs virtually replacing bank tellers and self-checkouts eliminating the need for a cashier at your local grocery store. But as technology advances and robots become autonomous, more and more jobs will go the way of the cobbler. In fact, a recent report by Australia's Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization says that 40% of all jobs will be performed by silicone-based lifeforms within the next 20 years. Even more difficult jobs, such as nursing, are increasingly becoming performed by machines. It seems almost as though, soon enough, the only human jobs will be robot repairman or CEO. While this is obviously an oversimplification of the problem at hand, the sad reality is that the majority of professions will soon become automated. And when industry becomes automated, the people who formerly held those jobs will likely become really, really poor. This mass elimination of the labor force can really go in two directions. If we continue down our current path of massive income inequality, it is likely that this disparity of wealth will simply grow. The rich will become richer, and the poor will become poorer, with the middle class all but eliminated. As even the smallest of wages dry up, however, this model will become unsustainable and could result in the outright collapse of the United States, with civil unrest resulting in upheaval likely causing a class war between the poor and the aristocracy, similar to what happened in the French Revolution. This would only happen, though, if corporate greed were to supersede human compassion, a possibility that is extremely likely given our current state of affairs. And civilian jobs aren't the only ones at stake. Military and law enforcement jobs, even civil servant jobs, will likely become eliminated as well, with increasingly autonomous weaponry such as drones, Nightscope K5, and even Boston Dynamics Atlas. Alternately, automation can mean additional freedom for all. Think about it. If virtually all jobs are subject to automation, and people are not required to perform these jobs, this means the human should have the luxury of time, allowing for relaxation, master craftsmanship, or even innovation in unforeseen sectors. We see the smallest inklings of this change with the advent of internet-based subscription services like NatureBox, Beyondies, and Vegan Cuts, as well as 3D printing, allowing for personal manufacturing of goods that were unimaginable just a decade ago. In addition, Startups have the ability to crowdsource funding now, allowing people's dreams of innovation to become a reality. In this scenario, education too can become a top priority for all people 
instead of a select few. With robots taking over all labor jobs, people will be able to focus on enlightening themselves and others, free of the constraints of the nine to five. People could also utilize this free time to farm or even hunt, returning in some ways to the self-reliance we have abandoned over the course of the past 150 years. Something like this would require a massive paradigm shift, likely the elimination of money and possibly even government. This is a leap many in our society may not be quite ready to take, but the alternative would still mean the elimination of these constructs, with a legitimate class war taking their place. But no matter what path we choose to walk on, we won't be on it for long. While the world of the not-so-distant future will see the rise of labor robots in the workforce, what happens when artificial intelligence becomes more intelligent even than the human beings that created it? We'll explore all this and more in our next episode. Do you want to destroy humans? Please say no. Okay, I will destroy humans.